entering into the month of Ramadan. Now, I used to be, I have to confess, a perfectionist to the extent that I visited a psychologist and told her that no matter what I do, no matter how often I clean the house, no matter how often I do the laundry, cook, wash dishes, pick up, scrub toilets, that the work is never done. And I told her that I felt like I just simply wasn't enjoying my family and children the way that I should. So she's a very lovely woman, and she told me, look, you're spinning your wheels. There is no such thing as the perfect, ideal housewife and household, wherein nothing is out of place, where everything is sparkly and organized, that life with young children is necessarily messy and unpredictable, and that I needed to accept that and move on and actually start enjoying my life and my children. So I am framing my advice from this valuable perspective. I had to make a shift, a transition from perfectionism to what works for me, i.e. it's good enough for me, alhamdulillah, I'm going to move on, I'm going to move forward with that. So. My advice is do what you need to do to make Ramadan right for you. Not for your mom, not for your aunt, not for your sister, not for your best friend, right? The one who's always put together immaculate house, five course meal on the table. Do what's right for you. Because what works for that perfect friend, what works for your mom, what works for your sister, what works for your aunt or your cousin might not necessarily work for you. So you have to do what fits your situation. Too often we read books that talk about the ideal Muslim woman. I've actually come across books by that very same title. And while I appreciate the sentiments proffered by the author, the reality is that there is no such thing, I believe, as an ideal human being unless we're talking about the Prophet وسلم, or an ideal situation. And we know that our beloved messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, dealt with many situations that were less than ideal. So I think we all need to, for want of a better term, cut ourselves some slack, right? And understand that the good Ramadan, the rewarding Ramadan, the uplifting Ramadan is the one that works for us right? So it's within that spirit that I offer this advice. And sometimes I think that the people who write these books, and they sometimes a lot of them tend to be men, haven't spent a lot of time around young children. I would venture to say that, right? So this advice is definitely for mothers of young children. Um, let go a little, be in the moment, and cut yourself some slack. In fact, the idea of cutting yourself some slack is kind of interesting because I don't think the word slacker and mother belong in the same sentence. As mothers, whether we work inside the home or outside the home, we all work hard, wear many hats, and juggle and balance multiple responsibilities. Ramadan, I think, should be that time to unplug a little bit, sit back, and enjoy those beautiful children Enjoy the tranquility in your household. Not necessarily the tranquility that's brought on by having a Martha Stewart catalog type home, but the tranquility that's brought on by knowing that you have given each person in your household his or her due. The tranquility that's brought on knowing that you are fulfilling your own personal spiritual goals. So it's within that spirit that I offer my advice. Now, let me say that I do have certain goals that I have set during this month of Ramadan. Just because I've embraced the good enough approach, i.e. I've left off the ideal perfectionist approach, and I've made the shift to the good enough that works for me approach, doesn't mean that I don't have goals. So before I offer my making Ramadan right for you rubric, and I apologize for the alliteration, let me talk about my personal goals that I've set this year. Um, they're attainable, and I think goals need to be attainable, but I think that by having achieved these goals, God willing, that when I reach the end of the month, that um, I would have felt like I accomplished something, and that's the idea behind um, behind these goals. Now, I did say that I want you to tailor 
my advice to your particular situation. But I think there is one piece of advice that in my world, in my view, is non-negotiable. And that is less screen time. Yes, that's what I said. Ironically, I'm sitting in front of a screen and making this recording. But I want all of us to go into the month of Ramadan and make a pledge that we're going to spend less time in front of screens and more time cuddling with those delicious little people called children. Less time in front of screens and more time on our prayer rugs, mushaf in hand, contemplating on and reciting and memorizing the word of God. Less screen time and more time just being in the moment, focusing on those wonderful things called hobbies perhaps or interests that don't involve Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So please, less screen time for everybody. Um, another thing is less cooking time. This might sound a bit counterintuitive given the fact that when you fast 15 or 16 hours a day, naturally you're going to start to anticipate that iftar meal at the end of the day. However, I have noted that in many of our amazing Muslim cultures that women often find themselves in the kitchen from daybreak to sunset. So I think it's important to reevaluate that and to see what you can do right now to make Ramadan meal time a little easier, right? Um, I used to follow Food Network quite a bit. Don't do that as much now. But I remember uh, reading a piece of advice from, from uh, Chef Masaharu Morimoto. And one of the things he said about cooking was, it's not something you think about, he says. You just get in there and do it. And I think I would relay that advice to everybody here. Don't think about it. Just do it. Jump in the kitchen. Prep as much as you can. Get it out of the way so that when Ramadan comes, you can just jump in that kitchen, do those meals, get it over with, and focus on something more important. Again, being with those delicious little people called children and also sitting down on that prayer rug, taking that mushaf, opening it, reading it, having time to actually make not just a paragraph month of du'a, but picture this, ladies, a whole page of du'a. Imagine that. You can do that during the month of Ramadan. It just means you might have to adjust your routine and your schedule a little bit. So my goals, less screen time, less cooking time, and also less housework. Because here's the deal. You know, the more you cook, the more dishes you have, right? And there are, of course, counters to clean and stovetops to clean and all that good stuff, right? Um, now, obviously, we can't eschew housework altogether during the month of Ramadan unless we're fortunate enough to have housekeepers, right? Um, there is the matter of clean clothing for everybody. But as Ansa Tamra Gray said in her beautiful speech, Lean In, our feminist manifesto that she gave at Zaytuna, women were not created to do laundry, Right? Women, like men, were created to serve Allah and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do what you need to do to reduce your burden of housework so you can focus on, again, on what's important during the month of Ramadan. Because I don't think that on the day of judgment we're going to be called to account about how sparkling our dishes were. I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call us to account as to how we used our hours during the day and during the night in devotion to him, right, and service to others. Now, part of service to others, indeed, is cooking and cleaning and feeding and all of that. That's all part and parcel of Ramadan, but don't let that become your whole Ramadan. Make sure you carve out some time for yourself. And then, finally, let me say, as far as other goals that I have during the month of Ramadan, I'm not the most artsy and craftsy mom, however, I do want to do at least one, possibly two, special projects with my children celebrating the month of Ramadan. I particularly enjoy those um, fanus um, uh, lanterns, I believe they're called fanus, the, the lanterns that come out uh, during the month of Ramadan, especially in places like Egypt, and so it's my goal to actually do some of those for the house and to also put up lights. You see, Ramadan has to be joyous and special for our children, not because we're trying to compete with Yuletide, but because children don't understand 
abstract, esoteric explanations of the inner dimensions of fasting. But what they do appreciate is the house is beautiful and festive and is decorated and mom and dad seem really happy and really enthusiastic. This must be a special time of year and it is indeed a good thing to be Muslim. So those are the goals that I have set during uh, the month of Ramadan. And this concludes the first part of my presentation. And for the second part, I will share my ideas regarding making Ramadan right for you. Thank you. And I want to talk about making Ramadan right for you. So I came up with this very simple little rubric based upon the Ramadan acronym, right? So when I thought about it, I said to myself, you know what? The R in Ramadan should stand for the idea of routines. Routines are of supreme importance during the month of Ramadan because what happens during the month of Ramadan is that Ramadan brings its own particular set of routines. And these routines of Ramadan kind of force us to change and realign our own routines, right? So we find ourselves doing quite, I think, an amazing balancing act as Muslim moms as we welcome the month of Ramadan. Because think about it. We get up. These days it's going to be well before 5 a.m. or so, you know, so we're getting up to prepare our, our sahur, our pre-dawn meal, right? That means that hopefully we would have gone to sleep at a decent time. Um, so just getting up, preparing the food, presenting that meal, making salat al-fajr, worshipping after fajr, getting everybody ready for the day, even though people aren't going to school, there are still, still routines during the day, um, thinking about iftar, car again, like I said, carving out time for personal worship, all of these things force us, I think, to bring, or I should say compel us to bring together different routines into one sort of coherent piece, that um, one sort of coherent strategy that allows us to have a smooth and harmonious day. So routines are very important during the month of Ramadan. You know, I am a firm believer in bedtime for children. I know a lot of moms waive that requirement during the month of Ramadan, and I understand why. Because we want to have a chance to go to the masjid, pray tarawih, you know, obviously before that experience the communal iftar. Um, but I do feel that when children are very young, that they don't have the attention span just from a developmental standpoint. They don't have the attention span to sit patiently and quietly during a 20 raka'ah tarawih prayer. So my advice to moms is to either establish tarawih at home or, jo or just go to the masjid for part of the tarawih. Obviously, if you're fortunate enough to live in a community that provides child care every night during the month of Ramadan, Feel free to go to the masjid, but I personally am of the opinion that children who cannot sit quietly, um, that it's best for them to stay at home so as to avoid disrupting the experience of the other worshippers. Now, older children should be able to sit quietly for at least a certain length of time, and I think it's important to show older children that we belong, that you belong to a community, that this is your masjid, about which you care a lot, that these are your fellow worshippers, right? Um, so, again, for me, I generally stick to routine bedtimes for my children during the month of Ramadan, with some rare exceptions if we're invited to iftar somewhere, or on the rare occasion that I do take them to the masjid for Salat al-Tarawih. But I believe that bedtime routine is important. Um, now, as far as the routine of getting up for sahur, obviously, the older your children are, the more you are going to want to encourage them to do that. And that's why I mentioned the whole thing about less screen time. It's not just less screen time for us as moms, but also less screen time for those older children, because the thing is, if they're falling asleep with their screens in their hands, they're going to be less likely, number one, to sleep well, and number two, to want to get up for sahur. So again, consider the way they're going to bed and how they're going to bed if you want them to get up for the pre-dawn sahur meal. Another thing about routines is that as moms, we understand the importance of mealtime. And Ramadan forces us to think about mealtime in a different way. All of a sudden, mealtimes go from being 8 a.m. and uh, 12 noon or 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. with snacks in between to maybe 5 a.m. and 9 p.m., right? 
So that is quite an adjustment to make. If your children are fasting, obviously they are making that adjustment with you. But if you have small children who are not fasting, my advice is to stick to the usual routine of, of, of the meal times for your children with maybe uh, slight adjustments to introduce the idea of fasting to them, right? Um, and then another thing too with routines that this isn't, we're not just talking about routines of wake, of waking and sleeping, but also discussing your spiritual routines, your awrad, which is a term that, a technical term used by some of the ulama to denote a regimen of, that involves Quranic recitation, adhkar or dhikr, remembrance of Allah, various ad'iya or dua or supplications, right? Um, a time for contemplation and meditation as well. And usually these awrad are done in the morning and in the evening, right? Um, and sometimes around Asr, depending upon which teacher or sheikh might have given these awrad to you. So it is important to have a specific time of day in which you sit and you read Quran, you make your dhikr and you make your dua, and this time really should remain non-negotiable and sacred, right, to the extent possible. Now, obviously, anyone, as anyone of small children knows that um, you are definitely going to be making adjustments to that schedule, but th there are times, I think, that you can really kind of carve out a little bit of time for yourself, unless you have an infant, in which case you're on call 24-7. But, um, you know, one of the times that Al-Ghazali mentions in his book, Beginning of Guidance, as well as the Ihya or Limadin, for that matter, is um, the time uh, right after Fajr, between Fajr, the first prayer of the day, and sunrise, that's a very important time. And I think it's a blessing that Ramadan coincides with summer break this year, which means that instead of frantically um, ending Fajr prayer and rushing to get everybody ready for school and work and so on, um, we can actually take some time and sit on that prayer rug and really make it a beautiful Fajr prayer and have a wonderful post-Fajr period of reflection while everybody is still hopefully asleep. So carve out those routines and especially those times and those spiritual routines for yourself. Now, the second part of my advice here, making Ramadan right for you, so the first part is R from Ramadan equals routines. The second part is um, A from the month of Ramadan. So A is for alignment. What you want to do is you want to make sure to align your routines and your goals with your family's needs, right? So, for example, a family that has... Um, Older teens is going to have an entirely different set of routines from a family that has infants and toddlers. So just make that adjustment as needed. You can, for example, be a lot more flexible regarding meal times when your children are older versus when they're really little and you have to feed them a lot and on time, right? So just keep that kind of thing in mind. Another thing, too, is that you're going to have to make some alignments to your goals based upon your family's particular needs. A family with older children should definitely have as its goal getting everybody up for sahur and having fajr prayer in congregation, for example. A family with small children, not so much. It might be the opposite, getting those children to sleep past a certain time so that mom and dad can enjoy that early quiet period in the morning. So again, A is for making alignments to these routines and your goals per the particular needs of your family, right? That's RA. Now, what is the M for? So the M from Ramadan is basically the idea of measuring, right? You want to be able to measure your progress. Um, you know, this is, in a way, based upon the idea of the SMART goal. It's specific and attainable and measurable and all of that. But I don't want to make it too scientific. But you do want to have some way of measuring your goal. And I think a good way is just, like, emotionally, where are you, right? I'm not saying you have to, like, observe and analyze and, and record data. But emotionally, how do you feel at the end of the day? And how do you feel at the end of the month of Ramadan? Do you feel like you've met your goals? Are you at peace with yourself? Are you content? Do you feel that you've been productive, that time was used, was used wisely? Do your children seem happy? Do, does it seem like they've learned something from the month of Ramadan? Is your spouse pleased and is your spouse content? 
Are you looking forward to Eid with the sense that, yeah, we had a really great Ramadan and we're ready for Eid, we're ready to celebrate our accomplishments? Or do you almost have the sense of dread, like, subhanAllah, I can't believe that it's Eid already and my Ramadan is gone and what did I do? So again, you know, a way of measuring um, your goals is, is very important. Now, that's our routines, A, um, alignment of goals and routines per your family's needs, M, measuring your progress. Now, A is accepting that you will definitely have setbacks because that is the sort of nature of life with children. It is, as um, my psychologist said, um, and she's a psychologist who actually diagnosed my son with autism, so she's always been a very kind of sympathetic, understanding person, kind of helped me to put things into perspective. But she did, you know, say that life with children is necessarily messy and unpredictable. So you know what? If you have a day that you couldn't get to your orad, just try again tomorrow. Don't beat yourself up about it. If you happen to serve frozen pizza for iftar, it's okay. You're not a bad mom. Okay? Those things happen sometimes. So accepting that, that these things happen and just moving on, right? And maybe just preparing a little bit more so that you can have a more gratifying day um, the next day, right? And understanding that ultimately Ramadan is not about having a perfectly segmented, compartmentalized day, but Ramadan ultimately is about three things, right? That inshallah, during the first month, the first part of the month of Ramadan, we attain unto God's rahmah or his compassion. That during the middle part of the month of Ramadan, we attain unto Allah Ta'ala's forgiveness. We earn his forgiveness, inshallah Ta'ala, and that during the last part of Ramadan, we attain unto al-'atq min um, al right? That, that salvation, right? Salvation from the fire. Ameen, ya Rabbala alameen. I mean, that's really what Ramadan is about. Now, the next part, so R, again, is for routines. A is for aligning goals and routines to meet your family's needs. M is for measuring progress. A is for accepting that changes need, might need to be made and life happens. D is for dad. And I mention fathers because fathers play a hugely important role. And I think sometimes, um, you know, we sort of um, underestimate the role that dads play developmentally in their children's lives. Our Islamic discourse is a lot of it is about men as providers, men as as in going out and working and um, earning a livelihood, which is wonderful. Except the fact that qawama al rijal qawamuna ala nisa in Surah An Nisa, Ayah 34, is not just about men being financial providers, but about men modeling spiritual leadership and mentoring to their families. So it's very important to encourage husbands um, and fathers to step into that role, especially with their sons, right? That they should model the type of behavior that you'd like to see from your children during the month of Ramadan. They need to see dad praying and being enthusiastic about fasting and helping mom out and going to the masjid and just being joyous during the month of Ramadan. A. The A in Ramadan um, is for allies. So you need to have allies. And this is especially for um, single mothers, for example. You know, you want to make sure you have that supportive friend, for example, or, or relative or family member who can help you to set aside time to pursue your own spiritual goals. That's the person who's going to come and watch the kids so that you have time to go to the masjid and be part of a community. I think it's very important to enlist those allies. Um, it's important to have allies no matter what, whether you're married or single, right? You want, you want that person to be the person who respects the fact that you're reducing screen time during the month of Ramadan. So, you know, and so, so the person who has the television on all night while you're at their house, you know, you might want to have a talk with them. Again, you want people who are really going to support you in your, in your particular goals during the month of, of, of Ramadan. Um, you know, an ally is a person who's going to be happy, for example, a supporter is going to be happy with that simple meal that you cook during the month of Ramadan. If they expect a 10-course meal from a harried, busy mom, I'm not sure if I would call them an ally. An interesting guest, yes, but not as supportive as they could be, unless it's potluck, in which case that's different, right? So A is for having allies, people that are supportive of these goals during the month of Ramadan. And finally, N is for next year. Thinking ahead to next year, and this is where the measurement part comes in. If at the end of the month of Ramadan, 
you see that, well, you know, I didn't really reach um, all of my goals, or I felt like I reached part of this goal, but not the rest of it, or this goal just didn't seem right for my family, you know, it's perfectly okay to make changes and adjustments and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow all of us to experience the barakah of enjoying this Ramadan and the next, inshallah ta'ala. So I pray this advice has been of benefit to all of you. And may Allah ta'ala accept our worship and our standing and our fasting and everything during the month of Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.